And I just really wanted to give a very brief um, sort of welcome to the gallery and an introduction to the fact that you know we're really um, interested in collaborative practice here, and it's something that we've been doing um, for the last few years. We're in the process of rehanging some of our collections, um, and we're working with people. Uh, to bring people's life experience and the curator's expertise together to co-curate and co-produce displays. Um, and what we hope is that those displays will be really relevant to people's lives. So um, we've also been working with the artist Suzanne Lacey, who has worked on an amazing project, um, in fact, all through lockdown um, since the start of COVID, um, with a group of 40 women uh, from across Manchester. Um, really amazing, uh, inspirational women. Um, and the project is all about work and women over 50, looking at the barriers to work, um, difficulties with the menopause, with care and responsibilities, access to work. Um, and what has really inspired me about that project um, is that it's been a real true collaboration. It's not just been a case of um, the artists sort of paying lip service to it, and no one gets to your opinion. Actually, every single decision on that project has been collaborative, um, and that has been amazing to see. Um, the final project I just wanted to mention briefly is we've been working with Jane Montserrat, um, and she has made some new works for our collection. And she has collaborated with people, uh, not just in Manchester, but also um, artists um, from around the country. Um, to really investigate um, the, the issues that she's interested in, which are to do with care, and care of people as well as objects. Um, and you can see both of those displays, the, the Uncertain Futures Project um, and the Jade Montserrat Project. They're both on display at the moment upstairs, so if you get a chance after the talk, um, please do go and have a look at them. So thank you so much to UP Projects for um, organising this event. We're delighted to be collaborating uh, with them. I think it's the first time that we've worked together, but hopefully not the last. Um, and um, I'm going to hand over to uh, the curator of UP Projects, Elizabeth Del Pepe, hope I pronounced that properly, um, who um, is going to uh, introduce the artist and tell us a bit more about the format for the afternoon. Thank you so much, Natasha, for that introduction. Um, my name is Elizabeth Lepete, uh, and I'm curator of Learning and Life Research at Art Projects, which is a public art commissioning organization uh, based in London, but active nationally. Um, I'm a white woman with long brown curly hair, um, and I'm in my mid-30s, and I'm wearing a pink shirt. Um, yeah, so we're really pleased to be here today and to talk about um, uh, what constitutes uh, collaborative practice um, with Jasmine uh, Four and Beverly Bennett. Um, this event will also expand on Jasmine's uh, commission at uh, Touchstones uh, in Rochdale, um, which, if you haven't seen it already, uh, will be open until the 13th of February in 2022. Um, the works in the exhibition have been commissioned by our projects uh, in partnership with um, Touchstones Rochdale. Uh, this new commission uh, forefronts the voices of migrant communities within the social history of Rochdale, which have historically been marginalised and misrepresented. Uh, Justine has been working collaboratively with a group of women and gender non-conforming people from Rochdale's Pakistani, Bengali and Punjabi communities, examining and responding to the context contents of the local history archives and touchstones. And the collaborative process has culminated in a book um, and a series of films uh, which meddle with traditional <laughs> archives and approaches. <laughs> <laughs> so um, this work really has been four years in the making. Um, initially our project reached out to touchstones to see if they would be interested in developing a uh, commission that would engage the communities in Rochdale. And this was welcomed by Touchstones because they were keen to fill and develop links with local communities. So uh, our project initiated the commission as part of its ambition to create opportunities for artists to have time to develop genuine engagement processes that inform the outcome of the work. So several aspects of this commission will continue to inform the work that we do, um, forefronting ideas of collaboration and co-creation, um, which are further investigated in other parts of the program. Um, Constellations is uh, one of these programs um, that uh, our project produces, 
um, which is an annual development program for socially engaged practitioners. But it also happened to um, have created the opportunity for Jasleen and Beverly Bennett uh, and Beverly to uh, meet for the first time in 2017, uh, 2018. Um, so we're really pleased that that encounter has culminated in this event today. Um, now, just a few information about the structure of the event. Um, so before engaging in a wider conversation, um, Jasleen and Beverly um, will do uh, short um, introductions to their work, uh, showing some films and some videos. Um, then uh, there will be a wider conversation about the topics of today's event, uh, followed by um, a, a Q&A, so around 3 o'clock, um, give or take, we will open up um, to the room for questions. Um, also, the event uh, is recorded by um, Alina Akbar and her, her collaborators. Um, Alina is a filmmaker based in Manchester who was also a collaborator of Jasmine during the project. And if you don't want to appear in the recording, even though um, actually you, you, yeah, this not that. <laughs> And, um, and then last day, today we're also launching the second episode of the uh, app podcast about the project. So there are some um, postcards on your seats. Um, <laughs> you can just follow the link uh, and you, you should be able to hear uh, Jasmine and um, some collaborators talk more about the project. Um, by midweek next week, there will be a written transcript of the podcast available on our project's website and accessible by the link on the postcards. And now, without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce you to Valerie and Jasmine. Um, I'll briefly read their bios and then I'll pass on the words. Jasmine Core is an artist based in London. Her work is an ongoing exploration into the malleability of culture and the layering of social histories within the material and immaterial things that surround us. Her practice examines inheritance, diasporic identity and histories, both colonial and personal. She works with sculpture, video and writing. Recent and upcoming commissions include Welcome Collection, Up Project, Glasgow Women's Library, Baltic Centre for Contemporary Art, Design Projects, and Hollybush Gardens. Her work is part of the permanent collection at Touchstones, Rochdale, Government Art Collection, and Crafts Council. Core, well, Jasmine is also a recent recipient of the Paul Hamlin Foundation's Awards for Artists, one of the most significant <laughs> philanthropic awards for visual artists and composers. <laughs> Uh, Beverly Bennett is an artist filmmaker whose work revolves, uh, revolves around the possibilities of drawing, performance, and collaborative experiments with sound. Beverly's practice provides space for participants to become collaborators and provides a point of focus uh, from where to pick ideas around what constitutes an art practice and for whom art is generated. Beverly has exhibited and worked internationally, including at the Cinema Africa Film Festival in Stockholm, Wising Art Centre, Grand Union, Peckham Platform, and is currently fellow at Serpentine Galleries. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for you, and I'll be to you, Beverly. Thank you. Um, thanks for coming on this rainy Saturday afternoon to um, witness a very candid conversation between Beverly and I, and thanks to Nazreen, Bahela, Bishra, Alina, the group participants. We never I never really know what language to use, participant people, groups, collaborators. We'll talk about that <laughs> uh, for being here today. That was a surprise, so thank you. Um, I'm going to really, I guess Beverly and I are going to share and let you in to um, projects specifically I'll be talking about Gut Feelings, maybe John, which is the project in Rochdale and Beverly will talk, be talking specific, specifically about another project of theirs that, to let you in a little bit so that we can then frame a conversation around this kind of work um, and we're going to leave enough time for voices <coughs> in the room so um, please feel like you can yeah, it feels like quite an intimate setting so hopefully you can join in at some point as well. Yeah, basically it's going to be like a conversation that we would have 
over tea <laughs> and you wouldn't necessarily be here. So yeah. if there's any swearing, then I apologize. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and that's how we brought this together through like voice notes that have been exchanged and text messages, even right up to this morning. This morning <laughs> Beverly was on the way to Manchester from Birmingham and I've been coming up from London and still no beautiful notes going back and forth. So yeah, we're, I think we're both really thinking this whole topic through, um, if we can call that a topic. But I'll quickly share a little bit about the work in, in Rochdale at the moment. So. Can go, oh no, it's a film. Right, that's fine. I'm going to show you some film snippets as well. But um, this is the work in Rochdale, which is titled Gut Feelings, Mary Jan, is the culmination of four years of work, not with the group specifically, um, but actually setting up the conditions to bring a group together was all of that time period, um, including a pandemic, including having a child, and getting funding together and, and finally the magical bit which is like working with these incredible individuals. Um, I guess I invited them to, I was drawn to the archive at Touchstones and I invited them to go looking for ourselves in the archive and to discover what we noticed there, who's speaking for who, um, how is this notion of like cultural memory or, or these ideas of history preserved and how is, how is that collective memory formed and what, would, what, could, what could an archive look like if it was separate from this institutional structure um, or that methodology, that format. So we, throughout lockdown, we were meeting on Zoom and we, um, I think I was seeing those conversations or gatherings as like study groups. I was taking part in a lot of, I think it was that moment in that first lockdown where online gathering was a thing and I was participating in incredible radical teachings led by friends and reading groups that were self-formed by, by friends and artists um, and I think I was experiencing this like what felt like such a, a profound kind of thing to be taught and to learn with friends that I was borrowing and sharing some of that experience with the group. So bringing, we were reading texts together, um, reading bits of Edward Said, no we didn't, we read bits of Stuart Hall, <laughs> uh, Amrit Wilson, bits from the archive of course, listening to podcasts and reading blog posts and they were all centred around or allowing us to have these conversations about our embodied archives and our relationship to this place, to this land um, and what, what healing might look like and what ancestral knowledge we hold on to in this diasporic life that we have that we might be able to um, yeah, share, lean into, talk about. Um, and this work this, these months of Zoom conversations, which would go kind of like, always extend the time that we were meant to be talking for, and go long into dark evenings of the winter, um, they became this series of works, which are these, like, these film works, and then this book, which is, it's actually different to this book, but... Um, but still. But still. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I'll talk a bit more about it. It's a seed book which kind of holds together, just for a moment in time within the exhibition, it holds together some things that were spoken in these sessions. And, and the films, which I'm going to show you a few excerpts from, that were filmed by Alina, um, are these, like, I don't know, like these reenacted or enacted rituals that um, they feel like they're kind of like remixing something that's traditional to, to create something new. So we eat bits of the archive, we wash things kind of ceremonially in yogurt um, and they're all situated in sites that are bound up with, you know, there's histories within those sites, whether that's empire, the, the industrial revolution. Um, so there's something that felt kind of cleansing or like renewal, something cathartic that was happening in these enactments. Um, and then the work together, I guess, is like 
and we'll talk a bit more about this, I hope, but it's trying to resist some kind of archival logic, like not just create something for the institutional archive. Like I, We talked about that quite a lot, and I was very transparent about what it might mean for us to come together and do this work together and not to just gather what feels like what, what this urgent work of like collecting oral histories or voices of elders, um, but trying to resist that in some way and kind of complicate this singular narrative of who was in the group. So these women of colour, non-binary people of colour, who are all from these shared but very different heritages. Um, I'll, I'll stop there and if it's okay to play, we're going to sh I'm going to show two little... Can we little, just... Um, yeah, of course. Uh, I just want to ask the question. The bone, is there a lot of dialogue in it? I'm just one, we're going to show Does one there minute. Is a lot of dialogue in it? A... Are there some titles? Some. Are there subtitles in these ones? Sometimes I think. In the archive, yes. There's subtitles in the one minute archive scene, yeah. Pakistan about 12 years ago and had taken British citizenship. About three years ago she met a man who was in Britain on a six month visit. She agreed to marry him and they moved to Manchester where they had lived together happily. He applied to the Home Office to stay permanently in the UK with his wife, a procedure which is perfectly legal and provided for in the immigration rules. His application to stay was dealt with by the agency in Manchester but the Home Office showed little concern for urgency. They went to her, Manche sorry, they went to her Manchester MP who took up the case with the Minister. Time went by, but in spite of procedures from the agency and the MP, no decision came from the Home Office. In the meantime, their difficulties were mounting. Because of the condition imposed when he arrived as a visitor, her husband was unable to seek work. And because he was not permanently resident in the UK, he could not claim supplementary benefits. After a long correspondence between the MP and DHSS, it was eventually agreed that in view of the long delay by the Home Office, he would be paid as a special case. She had been able to support them by going out to work. Oh. On the one hand, I feel like I'm losing my culture, my heritage, because I feel like I've become anxious in lots of ways, you know? But you need to hang on to it. And I think now, I'm thinking on to it, but for a long time, I suppose I wanted to continue. But now, but what I've got, now that I've got my own children, I feel really sad. Because I feel like we don't have what we have. My parents tell the stories, and I feel like, at the moment, I haven't got the patience to tell my kids those stories. I'm like, the cost of the them abroad, just for me and my two kids to go to Bangladesh, the airfare is going to cost about £4,000. I can't show them that culture. I can't show them their heritage. Even though I've them this home, another part of me feels like it's no sense to be close. But when we were in Bangladesh, they'd make fun of us because we were from England. So I got to go back there, but then I kind of feel like I'm not really wanted there either. So where do we put it? I guess I should talk about myself. Um, hi, I'm Beverly. Um, 
gosh, it's a bit nervous to follow on from Jasmine. And I don't have any people around me. I see the stars here. <laughs> so I'm going to adopt you for me. Um, yeah, so yeah, I'm an artist based between London and the Midlands. And maybe I'll talk a little bit how me and Jasmine like, first met. So I'm fortunate I'm part of the alumni of Constellations, which is Elizabeth said is a, a project where 12 different artists can come together and have aspirations of working with communities and creating socially political work. Um, yeah, and that was my kind of first foray into it. And I was fortunate enough to meet yourself through a mutual friend called Elizabeth Graham, who was part of Constellations as well as um, Helen Nesbitt, who's the director of Art Night in London. Um, and yeah, you kind of go in a little bit blind, but you're supported by the likes of Jasleen, Rohana Zaman, Helen Kamek, and I'm very fortunate enough to call them friends and people that I look on in terms of being inspired by their work. Um, maybe I'll just flick through my slides and that might give a little bit more of an insight into what I try and do. Yeah, let's go. <laughs> so the first one is called A Mine and there's a little bit of um, audio transcription but funnily enough at the start of it you'll hear Jane Montserrat's voice yes. which is so kind of serendipitous but yeah. <laughs> is called Simon Says Slash Dada. Simon Says and then Slash Dada. Okay. to make a short film and at that time I had no idea how to create film. I was also working full time at National Portrait Gallery um, yeah, and then was approached out of nowhere uh, and so I kind of took it upon myself to go up and down the UK and talk with friends of friends, other creatives about what it's like being a black woman today in the UK and kind of setting the story straight as opposed to what is featured in um, a stereotypes. I'm not going to say a certain newspaper, but they might have used certain terms. 
Um, and yeah, giving them space to share their stories and to kind of connect with me. We'll probably talk about this later on, but them forming testimonies. That was probably the first time where um, I made a conscious effort to create that space and to also learn from other individuals. So a mine came first and the little snippet that I'd shown is from the kind of introduction to a project that I'm doing, which is taking probably about the same number of years as Jasmine's work um, called Simon Says Slash Dada. So Simon is my father and Dada was my grandfather on my mother's side. And within this project, I'm looking at what we inherit through, um, yeah, through our histories and um, basically finding out who you are, like, you know, half and half of your parents and I'm starting to get an okay relationship with um, Simon but you know I'm wanting to find out more so in turn again working with women around the UK and um, London, Birmingham, Newcastle and Liverpool with different partner organisations and um, forming these what would traditionally be known as workshops but me and Jasmine have been talking about this I don't like calling them workshops, I call them gatherings because <laughs> more often than not, uh, the people that I work with, I learn more from them than they probably learn from me. <laughs> oh, yes. and, um, and sharing space, so we do this over like four weeks and form community and yeah, the attempt to try and heal from each other. Mm. So maybe I'll stop there. <coughs> I mean, I think we should just continue because now, like, I'm. I was just thinking about when I. We went for lunch when I was pregnant with Claude. Yeah. And yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, that's my mum. No, that's my auntie, but pregnant with my mum. <laughs> Is that what she just said? Yeah, Pam was my mum. Yeah. Um, and. We were walking to the train station, and I, you were going back to work, and you, you talked. You were t you were telling me about the work, the, the gatherings that you were holding in these various arts organisations to 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 get to the point where you might create film from what, that that is now this this kind of beginning. I, I understand that you're like it's an ongoing thing, right? Yeah. But for Simon says, Dada, and then like I guess. I'm thinking about like what, our first little point is like how and why we work with people or groups and um, maybe want to like frame that context and, and well you've just done the framing actually because it's like um, this is not arts engagement mm. this is something else um, and I think we both from that moment of speaking to you and um, understanding that like this work and this work is like born out of some other kind of need and desire and then like I just want to read there's a quote that you that you put in Simon Says by Judith Rich um, Dr Judith Rich and it says whatever healing work we do in our lives heals the ancestral lineage of the previous seven generations and the seven generations to come which um, I think is like a framework or a context for us to now speak about our work, which is you know not not ticking art, but art arts engagement boxes, but mm. it's coming from somewhere else. But I don't know. Should we talk a little bit about the hows and the whys we work with? Yeah, definitely. And also, <laughs> people who who have decided, who've been so generous about coming on the journey with yeah. us in yeah. that work. So I'm looking to superstars over here. Um, yeah, because it's just, I guess for myself, one, I'm really nosy. Um, <laughs> I like working with people and I'm interested in that idea of stories. We, we were texting about that today. Mm. Um, but just that kind of, yeah, it's, it's this feeling, like that intangible kind of ethereal feeling and that connection that we have to each other and trying to unpick it and explore more. Mm -hmm. And I guess 
time, like you know, you're saying four years, like exactly the same, and it's still continuing. It's it's like kind of cyclical in a way, like mm. reverting and then going back and finding out some more. But yeah, I'm going to go off on a tangent. I tend to do this. Did it begin with? Did it begin with your with with kin with family? Like I, I think about. Um, like I kind of loathe the term social practice. Mm. Like I never ever describe what I do as social practice, even though that's like the kind of art speak for this work. Or, yeah, it's the category that it would come under. But like I, as this naive student in this art school making jewellery, like the first people that I started to turn to were family members. Like whether that was like, and I know Alina is like doing that too right it's like and there's like an urgency to document oneself and whether that started off as like photographs in my nanny's house or like recording starting to record conversations or starting to ask the questions actually like because and and that for me comes back to this thing about being attracted to and i find it quite boring and sometimes limit limiting where i keep coming back to the archive like in the project in gravesend I went to the local studies archive again and found these incredible books written by this feminist writer group in Gravesend. But I'm attracted to like, um, I think when you exist in a, a, a whether that's a family structure or a wider like community structure or a mass of uh, like a diasporic community where there's so many silences, like uh, there's something that I am like. Um, like I can't quite get away from like being in dialogue and and being in dialogue with very with very specific people, right? Like it's there's a reason why the group is six women and non-binary people of colour, right? And um, I think you also kind of like reframe the idea of the archive, like mm. like we were saying that like, that kind of embodiment, like using that as a starting point to then unpick what you're happy to collate from it or divert from. So I think that's quite an interesting thing to have as a starting point. Me, myself, you know, yeah, I, when I first started making work, it was all about my family because that's the most accessible thing that I have. And funny enough, I'm still, I still keep going back to them mm -hmm. um, and rethinking what, you know, what a family is. Like, I'm fortunate enough to say that you know, I definitely consider you as part of the family and, yeah, um, yeah how we create it together. Yeah. I, I've got, like, written in my notes, which I don't want to overlook because I think it's really important. Like, we were just chatting before we started about um, how, like, the, the knowledge that is spoken by family or, like, other kinds of kin is, like, um, that's a it's a body of knowledge mm -hmm. and like what is it that you are then uh, like what hierarchies do you put in place but and I talk to my students about this that I teach it's like if you're going to research do you do you hold the library or that book offered by that writer or whoever is that theorist as being of higher value than something your nanny told you right mm -hmm. like what the the I'm, so for me, it's like that, that knowledge is equal or, or above, right? Like what, um, what could be penned or printed or held in a formal kind of academic yeah, text, whatever that might be. And then what, bringing that kind of work within an institution, what kind of hierarchy does that have within itself? Maybe that's me posing a question to you, which is a bit mean, actually. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so, yeah, especially with this project here, like, you yeah. know, placing it in touchstones in, you know, your first reference was to go into the archive and to mm. unpick, and now you're, you're within that area. How does that feel with this particular piece of work? Um, I think this kind of comes back to, like, how, the how of, like, what it means to invite someone into that, that work and, and yes, that, that, that institution or that structure. And I, I think I was quite, um, I'm just trying to remember the question so that I actually get to it. Um, I think I was quite 
open and transparent about that that we could see in the archive, like in the ethnic minorities section of the mm -hmm. I'm using speech quotes for ethnic minorities, Liz, by the way. <laughs> um, in that section of the archive, um, I could see this like evidence of this of arts funding. Mm. It's cyclic, right? Mm -hmm. And I the skeptic that, uh, that is me. <laughs> I also know that this work is oh, that's a whole other that's a whole other conversation, but like it's it, there are conditions that allow it to happen and, and that's money, right? So I could see in the archive that after some kind of like societal, social rupture, race riots, 9-11, there was like a pot of money that enabled an artist to um, reach out to community. And I'm I'm we I'm sure this is not this is not new this is not new like stuff to say that like art, the arts is often like a, a sticking plaster for the deficit that is state welfare or like um yeah, so I, I think I'm always uh, wanting to, like, if I'm working with anybody, whoever that may be, like, you've got to let them into the conditions that is the way, where you do that work mm -hmm. in the arts this, in this situation. So that, that letting, being transparent and allowing the project to then be political and, and that enabled us to, like, have have kind of sometimes disagreements too right about like how this work might exist in an exhibition or live on in the archive like the, there's this, this book it's a seed book that is going to get uh, planted it's not going to exist in by january we're going to read it and kind of create another piece of work out of like us reading these testimonies and these things from the workshop and then it will be planted back into uh, the grounds of community centre in Deeplish, mm -hmm. which is like a, tip, uh, a, work, a working class South Asian area of, of Rochdale. So there's, it, it's painful because the book is stunning, right? <laughs> and like everyone was like, can we just get a coffee, copy like, back, like under the table, like <laughs> just get a copy for us? And I'm like, yeah, we could probably do that. But the <laughs> archives should not have this, like what feels like an answer mm -hmm. to a problem. So. We spoke a lot about like resisting, like how do we want to how, how do we want to speak back to the archive or how do we want to speak for ourselves and how do we want to resist these um, like these formal methodologies of like you know like HLF funding to do oral histories is is yeah. it's happening in South Hall now with this first generation who lived through partition right it's like there's this desperation to gather that voice and I understand it. I understand that and I want that too, but I'm also, I want, I want the legacy of this work to be a question rather than like an answer. Mm. <laughs> Here's six voices for you. Yeah. Um, but how, how, when you work in like very intimate and like clearly, like just hearing Jade's voice, which I knew was Jade's voice <laughs> and I listened to it in my house as well. When you are inviting somebody to, when you work with testimony and the testimony of your own, because that's that's in in these films as well. Like you, there's a vulnerability, I think, to um, what you what what you are doing, and then what that enables maybe someone else to be part of. I think that's clear in what Jade's saying. But how do you? When you're working with testimony, how do you set up the conditions when you're when you're responsible for another for for individuals? Like there's something private and then there's public. Mm -hmm. And how do you negotiate that? Um, That's complicated, but you can try. <laughs> yeah, that is a complicated one. Um, I guess when I'm working with different institutions, for example, when we do these gatherings over a period of time. Um, we set up the conditions so that you know, curators or directors aren't part of that that sharing mm. um, as well as have individuals who 
can offer people within the group space to share. So I always have like a therapist on hand because, you know, there's not everyone has a great relationship with their fathers and um, yeah, they're available during the session and after the session. Um, yeah, and there's still quite a lot that we're unpicking individually as well as collectively. Mm-hmm. Um, other conditions that I'm just really honest about my own, um, yeah, about my own experiences, mm-hmm. which, and, and I try to be really genuine as well. Um, I can't you, imagine you'd be the enemy. <laughs> like, yeah. um, certain people. <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, yeah, because I hate that phrase, like creating a, a safe space, and you try really hard, but I think there's something more than creating a safe space. Um, I don't know, maybe just that terminology because it's like co opted. We spoke about that before. Yeah. Um, and that idea of like, you know, self care is co opted. And, um, but yeah, try and make a space where people have that agency and to really have like a kind of deep dive, and but to also feel really protected within mm. it. So that's what I try and create. Um, and we were talking about this. It, kind of goes on after the gathering, you know. Yeah. I guess the life of an artist, you know, you wake up, you think about your work, go you sleep, think about your work. But with this kind of work, it never stops. Yeah. You know, you, you're still like texting people to see how they are, checking in and um, because then they become, you know, part of your extended family and you wanna do what's right by them and protect them in whichever way you possibly can, but that equally you have to, well, maybe this is a question for you. How do you navigate that that space where you're supporting the individuals that you're working with? As, and how do you support yourself? Because it's quite a lot. It's, it's heavy work, basically. We don't really talk about how heavy the work can be. Mm. That we try and create, um, that we hold that space for. I mean, I do therapy. <laughs> oh, you're good then. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm not sure, you know, and like Lisa, who's in the room as well, who is no longer working at Touchstones, but was working at Touchstones through <coughs> this entire period and pre that, and was res- uh, does a lot of work on the ground, and so was the reason why the 10 people that were invited, or 11 people that were invited to have a a conversation with me to see if they wanted to be part of this project that came through yourself and Brian's like existing contacts and that felt really crucial because there were so many questions about like who's the group how do we bring a group together like it, it's complicated and then that boy that became like six seven including myself um and that was enough right and um yeah i'm, di- I'm digressing a little bit but Lisa would check in and, you know, check in on me and then also offered therapy Mm. to the group and myself as part of that work and and I think, like, I think that's, it felt like, um, we were kind of, like, working out as we went, like, how to best, like, what is best practice or, like, what's the right thing to do here, what are the needs? of these individuals and um but I'm not I'm not I'm not sure I'm very good at what you're just asking me actually <laughs> because I think there is a lot of like holding and like n- negotiating um you know working with arts organizations work, doing that work on the ground many desires in the room and really wanting to listen to them and not always being able to fulfill them but like yeah it's i'm not i'm not sure i'm not sure i've got an answer what do you think no i don't have an answer which is why i was looking to you yeah um, <laughs> yeah I, 
I think when I first started the Simon Says with the gatherings, um, I had a therapist at the end of the session, and now right. we're revisiting. So I'm going to all those locations, and we're like, hey, because mm -hmm. um, we're going to start things up again and mm -hmm. hopefully move forward. Um, but yeah, I, I don't have that therapist anymore, and yeah, it's like negotiating that space where someone said that um, it was a really special moment where we were able to come together, and one group called themselves the Sisterhood, and they didn't realise how um, important it was for them to come together, and, and now that it's kind of like gotten quiet, um, they're realising that need again, and I've kind of got that that particular hat on where I'm like, okay, so let's see if we can try and support them in this way, but it's equally mm. really hard. Mm. Um, I think that's an important thing to note that, like, um, I think in this, even just in this last week, I've like been, I've turned down a, a, a commission which was an invitation to work with in a community setting in like the outskirts of Glasgow. Um, and I, and I was clear about why I was turning it down. I was turning it down, not because I don't need that money, <laughs> but because um, I, I'm, still, I'm not done with like working with the group. The group. Oh, I, hate the, I hate the language. The language is insufficient with, with the group in Rochdale, but also the Sahili Women's Group in Gravesend and the group in the Children's Centre in, in uh, Serpentine, these have been like three slow, long, very specific, uh, a, a, like an incredible individuals that are part of this work and I don't have it in me and I also don't want it, like I thought about it, I was like, what would a, what would a series of workshops look like, what, mm, workshops, that's the <laughs> issue, right, what would it look like and I was like, I don't have it in me to make these connections and um, I can't hold them. So like I'm not going to do it, <laughs> and because it's not a methodology, it's not something you can apply. Like the conversations I'm having with the Sahili Women's Group are really different to the, to the conversations with Nazreen and Bushra and Rahela and Alina. Like I kind of want to like secretly be Alina's mentor and like make sure Alina keeps making her own work. Like that's I'm going to try and help Riz on a project with touchstones, like the, it might not be a formal group, but, but the, yeah, like you say, there's like relationships formed that you want to, that you care for, so like, um, isn't there some kind of like, cycle, there's like a rule of how many people you can have in your life or something, anyway, <laughs> I think I've reached my max. <laughs> I think I'm still going, but maybe I should have reached my max. Um, yeah, it made me think about, um, trying to, at the end of Simon Says, trying to involve, um, yeah, it's like, it's horrible saying groups, and then also at the same time, I don't want to say their names, because, you know, I don't want to give, you know, it's yeah. consent and everything, so I'm, I'm going to use the term group, but, For now, yeah, yeah um, I can say one person, Baby Oracle, because we nicknamed them, but, That's a good name. Um, yeah, so at the end of the Simon Says project, hopefully it'll come in the form of, like, multiple exhibitions and that the participants in the project will be curating the public events Brilliant. as opposed to having um, you know curators within the institution uh, curate so them yeah. um, and that's probably like that idea of saying a kind of way into the institution which in your own terms mm -hmm. and feeling that you have the space to negotiate but also continue with that collaboration after you've left mm -hmm. and I think the whole reason why trying to decide to use this kind of methodology is that you know they they represent the community it wouldn't make sense me saying like oh yeah we'll have like a curator from London mm -hmm. based in Birmingham who doesn't know anything about the area mm -hmm. um, yeah for them yeah, to yes. have that ownership and to also bring people in when it comes to events like these yeah because it's you know, it represents them. Yeah. Can I ask you about um, archive? Da -da -da. Like, yeah, I good. wanted to ask about, because when I was watching Amine, um I was really aware of, like, 
I think what the thing that stuck with me was like this conversation between, and I've forgotten the individual's names, but there's this conversation that's happening around like between um, yeah these two individuals who who are talking about the music industry and like not deciding to not be one of them kind of opening up and saying like I decided to not be part of the music industry because I saw how you struggled as a black woman. Um, and it, it, it struck me because it made me think about um, like these, what you were saying at the very beginning around um, what that work, what that film was about kind of, it's auto-ethnographic, right? And it makes me think of Gemma Desai, who is a shared dear friend, who had this, event at the ICA in London and it was called Autoethnography as Refusal. So autoethnography, like my, my de de definition of it is like you, you speak your own story, you narrate your own story. Um, so yeah, speaking for oneself, right, and what I saw in my mind is lots of black women speaking for themselves and that feeling like, a, like for me that's archive. Um, do you see your film or the work you do as that? Like, is that it's a quite a big cumbersome word? Like, I kind of hate, and it's been used a lot at the moment. It's, it's gone a bit trendy. Yeah. But like, <laughs> like, do you see what you do as archival? And like, do you, what's your relationship to embodied or formal archive? Um, I guess yeah. I see it as a uh, archive as a small a. Um, because it's away from the formal kind of setting of what organisations or institutions would consider as archive. Mm -hmm. um, this conversation that we're having is a form of archive. Yeah. Like the breath that we have is a form of archive, those yeah. traces. Um, yeah, and like with my earlier work with photography, it's like documenting a certain period of time that's definitely archive. Um, but also with that, and I guess that's also with language that it can also evolve. Mm -hmm. So maybe there's certain sections within a mind that I might change. Nice. Yeah. <laughs> um, and probably that talks to how long the projects are because I'm still thinking and trying to figure things out. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I would definitely say that it's linked within that, but. But yeah, where it sits is very different. Um, fortunately for, for myself, a mine is part of the um, collection in, um, in Jamaica, the National Gallery of Jamaica, Amazing. which is really nice because like, you know, both my parents are Jamaican mm -hmm. and, um, and it's also in my mom's name. My mom passed away last year, so it means like a great deal that she's, you know, kind of gone back home. And um, so yeah, that's a kind of like archive as well. Yeah, mm. that's beautiful. But um, how do you feel in terms of that idea of archive and those traces? Mm. And do you know what? Like years and years ago, like probably fifteen years ago, I came across this. A book or a lecture or something that was talking about Gramsci and like uh, there was this quote that's like it said Hist history leaves in us an infinity of traces I was remembering that on the train up because of, uh, and what we were speaking about when you were having lunch like um, I'm trying to I'm on a personal level like outside of art and making and whatever that is I'm, I'm really trying to like think more about the body as and you said that in Constellations, you, it, you had said body as archive at some point. And I was thinking about like um, the flaws in this <coughs> colonial archive, right? Mm -hmm. This classifying, documenting, labelling, um, like the flaws in that. And, and something that we spoke about in the group, and actually, yeah, Nazreen, like, who brought the title into being, because you messaged me saying that like you were surprised, Mary Jan, my my love, mm -hmm. my dear, you were surprised how your body was reacting to mm -hmm. stuff that you thought was done and fine and like or being of diaspora done that. Like, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um 
So I'm, I'm trying to think about like what I'm holding this book as if it's some kind of like, I don't know, it's a book called No Archive Will Restore You by Julietta Singh. And like they talk about like these illegitimate, messy, unauthenticated body archives. And that's where I'm at. And like the stuff that can't be said or written or documented or, um, yeah, something that's more magical, like that quote by Judith Butler that talks about this kind of magical ancestral we don't even know how it's functioning or operating, but like, um, yeah, legacy, I guess, might be a better word for archive in, in the way that I'm thinking about it right now. Mm. Um, yeah. I'm, aware, like, I'm just aware that it's like, yeah, yeah just gone after three. See? Three, is it? Yeah. And I want to open it up, but thank you. No, thank for, like, you. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, does anybody have any questions? <coughs> We can continue to rabbit on, I'm joking. <laughs> I have a question actually, and it's a bit unfair me asking it because in a way I want to um, bring us the. I'm so happy you passed the mic. Yeah. Um, if you're happy. You. I suppose, <laughs> my question is I've been really thinking about sort of the, you know, the integrity of this working practice and how much time it takes, how it has to be really democratic, it's kind of very sharing and everything. And I suppose. Um, and, and also it requires from the, the people that are involved a lot of time and commitment over a long period of time. So my question is, I suppose, about what, you know, when you're trying to sell a project to people, well, that's the wrong, wrong expression, but you know, when you're trying to, yeah, sorry, that was completely wrong expression, yeah, when you're trying to encourage, to, to, to tell people, well, I'd really like you to be involved in this project, and we're going to do it together. I suppose, you know, it's sort of like, what, do you have to think about what what the people will get out of it, what you're asking people to, to commit? So it's a sort of question partly to you, but also partly then to those of you who've been involved in this, that, that what do you get out of being involved in a project like this? What made you say yes, that you would do it? I remember when I spoke to Jocelyn, the very first conversation, um, I think we just talked about what we were interested in. I was talking about, I was interested in um, the histories, our histories of my family that I hadn't even spoken about at all, um, underrepresentation within the arts, those kind of things. And I was thinking about doing a PhD at the time. I was doing a master's at the time. And I was looking at these things in my master's. Um, and we just started off with conversations, didn't we? Mm -hmm. and, it, and it kind of evolved from there. And, and I didn't know anybody else in the project. And we just kind of become, through working through the project, become a really close group. And we didn't know each other at all. And we live in the same town and don't know each other at all. Mm -hmm. How about you? Um, well, my experience is a complete different. Um, first, I'm a very loud person anyway, by nature. Um, I'm very arty myself, but never thought arts is for people like us, and um, I can't remember who reached out, may, it may have been Lisa, um, uh, and I was just, arts, you know, you're going to be involved in some art project, and that was in, that was the in for me, and then touchstones, it's like, well that's really bizarre, maybe I'm the right colour for a change, and that's the thought that came to my mind, um, and that's me being honest, um, I don't know how else to be. So I was just intrigued and like, oh, somebody wants to talk to me. Mm -hmm. And and I'm, it's always interesting, somebody actually going to spend some time with us and listen to us. And for me, I, I think it's been an absolutely amazing journey. I'm still reflecting upon my own reactions and how it's probably altered my vision and the way I see my life and how, not see my life, but an alternative form of capture. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and yeah, so yeah, it's been, I think I'm still on the journey, just. Mm. Yeah, me too. I think I'm still on the journey. Yeah. What about yourself, Pusha? And then I met these yeah. crazy yeah. both nights. Yeah. I thought, yeah, yeah. I'm not even wrong. Well, I was on the panel when uh, we had the, you know, they came up four years ago. And I love Jasmine's work. And I said to Lisa, I'd love to have a chat with you. Yeah. Just hang out with her when she comes. And it's been kind of like, yeah. 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 Yeah.
like Natalie said, like we, we live, like I live down the road from Natalie, really know. and I've never met her or spoke to her. And, and like when you were saying before, um, it's not like, we're like family, it's weird. It's kind of, like you said, it's that connection. It's not just art with this project. We're all family, everybody, you know, it's just, um, yeah. yeah. I think going back to your question, the original question is, I think people like us, or from my communities, and I feel I can talk for my, my ladies, is ask us, mm -hmm. look at us, you know, um, just validate us and we're there. We've always been there, but never from here we've been asked. So when conversations took place, I had nights where I cried, because mm -hmm. um, I was not reliving my own. I was like, I ain't got time to do that, but God, I can't believe what mum and dad went through mm. and we just took mum and dad for granted mm. and, and and I still kind of sidestep it because it stops me from trying to maintain some sort of quality in my life and that's where you're on your resistant line should I delve any further mm -hmm. can I you know but I, I see things differently I think it's also yeah. that we were given a platform to have to tell our authentic stories you know <laughs> Initially, when you said it, we weren't, I don't think we were thinking it was going to be this big whole project. It was just these stories. And we kind of had similar stories, but very different. Um, what you were saying before, you know, some of them were yeah. quite similar. And we had different backgrounds. Yeah. You guys would speak a lot of Punjabi, and I was like, I'm not, I can't yeah. speak Punjabi, I don't understand it, please speak in English. I think that felt important to hold that in the space where, like, <coughs> it was like, uh, so, uh, and we talked a lot about language. I know I did with art projects as well. You know, like, we cannot say South Asian. We cannot say marginalised communities. We are not saying ethnic minorities unless it's in quotes. And then um, that was also that like, I didn't have the language either, right? Like, so I was trying to find it and I said, oh, how do you identify Bengali, Punjabi, Bangladeshi? Like, that's what we say then, always. That's what we say. And it was like, um, Yes, there are shared connections, but there's so much difference in the, in the six, seven of us that it's like, obviously, obviously there would be, right? I think it was the trauma that connected. <coughs> but it's been a beautiful experience. I'm really fascinated with this art thing. It's like, gosh, wow, I can't believe I'm actually coming to an art gallery. It's like, I'm always going to go to an art gallery and I think I've made it. When we show, I mean, when we do, for the preview, I was just like, I'm still working in the arts, so it's <coughs> but I was like, I'm just really excited. I can see Asian kids in an art gallery yeah. running around, and suddenly that was brilliant, you yeah. know. And there was another show on, but it was the fact that I can see people who look like me in the art galleries, and this is what I've been kind of striving for because I've worked in education and art for a long time, and our community is super talented. Mm -hmm. But we don't get given that platform for the ones we were, and it was it we felt genuine. It wasn't just tokenistic, and I think that was really important. Yeah. <coughs> Do you have a really practical note, note as well? Like I've got down here, which I haven't said. We talked about how handing, or like working in this way. If you're interested in doing this work, right, it, it decenters you as this voice of authority, mm -hmm. and it holds you accountable. Always, right? We talked about how up until the last minute, up until something goes to print, mm. even now, if somebody was unhappy with a bit of the footage, we pull it, right? Mm. This is not material gathering. It's um, you're not making art from this group of people. Yeah, it's not always, your material. yeah, yeah. Mm. So being held accountable, but also asking. Um, the organisation who is funding this to also be held accountable, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, I think there's a there. It's it's a dialogue, and there's always asks, and one of those asks was we need to pay people. Yeah, <laughs> that's <Isn't that> so <laughs> basic. Though? Mm -hmm. Like people are spending two and a half hours talking with me on a Monday night. We need to pay them for their time. What should we pay them? What do you pay me? Yeah. <laughs> but it's yeah, something we, we we. Sorry to interrupt you, Jessie, no, but it's something we take for granted somebody would ask to you know do something we'd go the extra mile and not think anything of it because we don't 
value our own time. We've never been taught to value and how 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 do how do you value something? Yeah. How do you value care, compassion, and just being there and meeting the person where they are, um, and not meeting your need. And mm. you lost me in life. I I felt lost through this project because I thought I was found. I knew my identity and how this perceived identity I have. And then with all this, I was like. I have got you, I have any more. Oh, um, well, yeah, you've broken me, Jasleen. <laughs> 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 in the town today, I was saying, do you remember one of the conversations I was talking to you about, yeah. and, and we were saying, you know, and it's actually opened up me looking into my own history, my own family, mm -hmm. you know, things that I've heard about. Um, and I was like, one of the things that I was talking about was where my dad had bought my mom a knitting machine and she mm -hmm. knit jumpers. Mm -hmm. And now I'm doing my own research. Like I found one of those old knitting machines and they knit my mm -hmm. own jumper mm -hmm. like my mum did. Where was it? It's going to be at the, I'm going to do it at the university. Oh my goodness. Thank you so much. It's really amazing to hear your voices. It's really powerful actually what you, you know, just said. You should have been talking for an hour. So does anyone else have any questions? Yes. Yeah, I have a question. Um, I just want to say thank you so much. And like my heart and my head is so full um, in such a good way and I, I wanted to um, bring up the fact that these exploring of our own you know, family, you know, people in our own families and stuff and my nani was 17 at the time of partition and I feel like her experience is embedded in all of my work. And there's so much that I feel this urgency because we're losing that generation mm. to try and preserve. Mm. And um, I'm a creative, but I also work across the square yeah. at the Armored Iqbal Ulla Race Centre as a producer. <coughs> and part of my work is to um, archive uh, black, Asian and global majority community stories. Yeah. And it's so nice to sit in this space and be reminded that art is heart and it's intimacy yes. and it's connection away from this you know, market, market mm -hmm. selling, you know, extracting industry. Mm -hmm. And when you were saying that you've got this book that you were going to bury in January, mm -hmm. my heart was just like, my mind was blown. And I, and I get it. I get why you would mm -hmm. want to do that. But how else can we preserve these stories, these, and I say the sacred stories of our families, so that in a hundred years' time, you know, generations will still be able to experience those as well like what are those other ways i don't have an answer i'm just throwing it out there like how else can we archive or make sure there's a legacy that's Absolutely. yeah that's you know it's a good question yeah. um, you just keep talking <laughs> <laughs> you find yourself you keep talking you just keep yeah keep mm -hmm. it going keep sharing the stories and then generations and generations will learn from that and Remix the stories, yeah. evolve the stories. Yeah. That's it. And make sure that you listen to each other. Yeah. That's what I would. I was just thinking about the like the the body of this book. We the reason why that came about was like thinking about um like really wanting to embed the work with a certain type of politics. Like being really aware that at some point this work was going to be in an exhibition setting and that we were going to be gazed at mm -hmm. and then um, like talking to the group about like in my cumbersome lines that I really want to complicate the narrative yeah. I really want to like make that eating of the archive scene over an hour long like, I don't want to lose any of the eating that you did <laughs> because I don't care if somebody doesn't sit there for one hour the point is like it it shouldn't be consumed and mm -hmm. um, and we spoke a lot about how to have and, and I've been speaking to Beverly about that too, because I'm also trying to work out like how do how does the how does an artwork have agency mm -hmm. when it's no longer in your control? Mm -hmm. um, and so we're filming the reading of that, and that will go back into the archive as a film. Um, and Chakra, who's um, part of this work, who works in the local studies archive, dropped me like a panic voice shot being like I don't think we should bury it, like I don't think I don't think we need to have that in the archive and I think it's just I mean who knows we might print it again and put it in the archive. But I was talking to Alina about like how yeah, speaking for oneself, we we, we were reading the archive and we were reading 
some narrated version of someone else's life from Delunda, and it's like they are completely have no power or autonomy in that document. So really wanting to like hold on to like this cannot be read by anybody else. This is, the people are listening to someone's voice who said that thing. So trying to play with that, I guess. So and also that kind of like makes me think about Helen Kamek's work and how they create film and that they um, that there's one piece which is owned by Tate where there's fragments of Franz Fanon and Stuart Hall and obviously it's through her voice but in some ways if you didn't know the text you think that it's literally her kind of diaries it's really interesting the way in which she uses that methodology and how she creates really important work so it mm. kind of makes me think of that too like yep. with the archive scene yes you kind of like ingesting and kind of like regurgitating mm. but also remixing it at the same time yeah, yeah, especially yeah. with that that breaking up mm. like you know anyway yeah, cool. thanks for mentioning you and Hamak in this room as well. <laughs> <laughs> always gonna fangirl with him <laughs> institution and communities. Mm -hmm. So I'm working in a group paid by an institution as a practitioner, but also in a, um, you know, in an almost two-way weird dialogue with a group of Pakistani heritage mums who have grown up together since they were about four years old in Nelson, in Lancashire. It's a very complex situation with, you know, when we're constantly thinking about, you know, kind of all of the stuff that you've talked about. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I feel it's just been wonderful to listen to you speak and articulate so well a lot of the things that are on my mind. But my question, I suppose, is um, in attempting to do the things that you've described, how important is it actually to create a visual or aesthetic outcome in the form of a piece of artwork or an exhibition? Um, or when is the work actually kind of finished? Another great question, mostly. I, I feel like I'm not. Um, I and think you were like, you always ask us, didn't you? You always ask, are you okay with this? How do we all feel about things? And we all have different, and we're very strong women, and we all have different ideas. Mm -hmm. So I think that was, you gave us that space, I think, to kind of, and we navigated and we negotiated as well, didn't we? Mm -hmm. I don't know, I'm like a person that's like, that I, I like love materials and like Alina's sensibility in the filming was like, you know, we, I felt like we were working from the same vein often, like, and, and like leaning on Alina to like decide on the archive shot as well. Cause it, so there was, there's like, we care about that stuff too. Mm -hmm. So there was a care within the group, like there's artists within the group, there's activists within the group that was like, we had, a, we all had this shared like, um, yeah, maybe that didn't feel like just aesthetics, it felt like, um, I don't know, like part of, it's just part of what we were thinking, but... Can I also gosh. jump in? But yeah, I really love the fact of those, those aesthetics as well, because it's like a way in, and it's something that's, the shots are just beautiful, I've been fangirling before about them. Yeah, the, and, not. <laughs> and the way in which it's centred, but then... It's like you're literally the focus, that, and then you could kind of unpick what could happen at either side, especially that scene when mm -hmm. you're on the steppers, it's like the wow. past and then the future and what's happening now in the middle. It's just extraordinary. Mm -hmm. It's so beautiful. I could talk more also, but like I love the dresses as well and that. You know, anyway, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Yes. I've put it in. I think part of my question is kind of could the work be done without the the outcome, you know. Uh, I think what you've seen in the exhibition is a snippet of the, it's edited. Yeah. We were chatting, Alina and Bushra and I were chatting until two in the morning at Bushra's house yeah. a day before the opening. I don't even remember when it was, the day before filming maybe. And the day before filming. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And we were just, I thought they were, what were we filming the next 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 You cannot forget that. Of course you can't forget that. Um, we were talking about how like all the stuff we talked about that night isn't in the work. So mm. it is an edit. Mm. And that's I think that's power too for, mm. for a, a group to decide what is made public and what is not and for everyone to feel okay about that. I wish we could have taken longer to do all that too. I did feel rushed towards the end of going to print. You know, yes. the subtitles are not in these edits because we were pushed for time. So they're, they're, it's not perfect. The conditions we were working within are not perfect. Um, it, not the filming scenes, we were freezing. Yeah. There was a storm <laughs> coming in as well. <laughs> I'm going to just give you the pieces of paper, just, mm -hmm. just read from mm -hmm. it. And that was just so much easier, mm -hmm. wasn't it? Like, I don't understand what we were doing in the middle of the paper. <laughs> 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 there was a moment where Natalie came up to me and said, Can I have your pieces of paper? And I was like, Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And then we came up to me, well, she swore as well, but I didn't want to swear. But it was just the beauty of it. Is this what you call art? surrounded by cows and then when it came <laughs> together and I was like oh wow I've never yeah, it's, it's just beautiful yeah. it takes, it's going to take time to digest yeah. but wow but that in itself is such a big question oh, so yeah. what we're called that I would say like yeah. 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 who's defining it like why is it not documentation I was telling my children when I got home like, and they were talking, talking home, about the exhibition snippet of the process but that's just a question for you I could lose my way in this and I think I want to add this, and I, for me, I think it's very important. I was raised, my father and mother both were born in India, so the way I speak my maternal tongue, Punjabi, is how they spoke in India, mm -hmm. although the Pakistanis are Muslims. So I was born in Huddersfield, and we had a vast number of Indian friends. I then, we then came to uh, Rochdale, and there's no Indians to be found. Mm -hmm. It's like, where have they all gone? And then Jasmine, I was looking for a penny pot, do you know any Indians? I need to get back into it. I, I'm missing the way I speak my language. Mm. And then I met Jasmine, and it's just... With really shit. Jasmine's now teaching Jasmine. Like, yeah. 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 you, you left a voice note for my nani. Yes. And I can't tell you how happy she was to hear your tears from Jasmine. Oh, bless. And she knew exactly where you were from. Yeah. Exactly where you from. Which village I was from, from yeah. India. Yeah, I yeah, we, My dad lives here. Pakistan? Yeah. No, no. Okay. I don't want to wrap this up. Yeah. This is Sorry. Have you got a short question? It, yeah, it was actually. As you think about what art has um, changed everything. Oh, like, gosh, right? yes. I see everything differently. Mm -hmm. uh, everything I do, I'm trying to think, okay, gone on the evaluation of questions. How do I capture this in an alternative form? Mm -hmm. Which is tangible. And I see everything differently, from a different perspective, from a different lens. My lens has changed. Mm. There you go, my lens has changed. Mm. Ah. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, <laughs> great. that's great. That's great. Thank you. Thank you ever so much. Um, thank you for coming and participating. Thank you so much, Beverly and Chesley. It's been really fascinating to listen to you both and to, you know, hear from women and the, just everything about it has been has really kind of made me rethink I suppose what what I thought I knew mm. about collective art practice. So I hope you've all got something out of it and um, yeah and go and see the show in Rochdale. Thank you for the opportunity.